Let's see. Got everything ready, and you guys can see the screen, the PDF. They all good on my end. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, hello everybody, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Michael Kabuko, and welcome to the CGMA Jam session, where we dive into the creative mindset of artists from around the globe. Today's guests are Clinton Crumpler and Kurt Kupser, both look development and environment artists. And Kurt's currently at the Coalition, whereas Clinton is at Midwinter Entertainment. And they've worked on iconic titles such as Gears of War. And in addition, both are resident CGMA instructors teaching modular environments and texturing and shading for games, respectively, which we'll cover later in this webinar. Well, guys, it's a pleasure to finally connect with you. And once again, thanks for joining me on the show. Yeah, of course. Yeah, totally. Thanks for having us here. Yeah. yeah. So I'd love to kick off this conversation with getting to know you more about you guys and uh, learn about your origin stories. So let's start with you, Clinton. Um, how early were you exposed to art? Sure, yeah. So um, I started uh, with art uh, when I was, of course, like most uh, artists, like the whole, like, I like to draw when I was younger and stuff like that. But sure. uh, I was never really good at drawing. So, <laughs> but I liked, I liked <laughs> art. So I was like, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way that I can do this without having to be good in that kind of sense. So um, mm -hmm. I ended up going to school for graphic design uh, for college for my first run through. And I liked that a lot. Um, but I found that uh, it was really enjoyable to be able to do it through, you know, like programs like Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that. And so I found that I was better at those things than traditional art. Um, so kind mm -hmm. of pushing through that is when I, I kind of was like, okay, I'm going to go back to school for a couple more years to learn a little bit more about uh, 3D and stuff like that. So I went for animation, um, and then I also went and continued on into game design and game development. Now, to reel it back, uh, which school did you go to? Uh, my first school I went to for graphic design was um, Longwood University, and that was in Farmville, Virginia. So a really small school, uh, just trying to like under get my bearings, just trying to understand the, the practice. And then uh, my second school was Savannah College of Art and Design, and that was a college oh, wow. down in Savannah, Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Definitely know about that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So how was it though? How was Savannah College of Art and Design? I, I love I love Savannah. I love you know Savannah College of Art and Design. It was great. Um, I think the the teachers there were really good because a lot of them were fresh out fresh out of the industry. Um, I actually uh, our studio head or at the the school head at the time was Louis Cataldi, and he had just finished working on Homefront and a bunch of other games, and so. Mm -hmm. um it was just really it was just really good to have people that knew what the hell they were doing so i, I think that's yeah, yeah, it's always course. it yeah. always makes a big difference in learning when you have teachers that you know are in an industry and like have a direct exposure to that kind of thing sure and, and then so so you uh scad was probably your third year say over your overall art education would you say you kind of restarted when you hit scad yeah, I kind of restarted when I hit SCAD. So I, I finished out my uh, bachelor's in graphic design, and then um, I got my ended up getting my master's or my second bachelor's in animation and my master's in game design. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of lot of schooling, a lot of debt. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, if you don't mind me asking, how how much is a average tuition cost for SCAD or? Uh, SCAD at the time was, I think it was $34,000 a year. And now I think it's $48,000 a year or something like that. Yeah. It's pretty, wow. it's pretty okay. outrageous. Yeah. I, I yeah, took out yeah, a lot yeah. of loans and I, I did a lot of, I, I basically, I basically worked like two side jobs and did everything I could to kind of reduce the debt. Darn. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now SCAD covers more than just, um, say like game design. I, I know SCAD of, from the animation background because I know a lot of uh, people take that route too over at SCAD. Mm -hmm. um, so what were the other programs at SCAD aside from game design? Uh, they, they were kind of a, they had pretty much anything that was, that you would want to do in art. They had everything from fashion design to comic books to um, pretty much anything like interior architecture, um, historic preservation, uh, more of the digital stuff they had like, uh, they had like digital painting for like concept artists. They had um, anim traditional animation. They had game development, um, 3D animation. Pretty much anything you, you'd want to do in that in that regard. Mm, okay, cool. And then now, now knowing you know the availability of resources now with online education, 
would you kind of cater if you could do it again would you kind of cater it towards a mixture of both the brick and mortar school and also go take online courses i think uh Nowadays, like at the time when I was going to school, like there was only like four websites you could go to to learn okay. how to use Unreal. And so like hmm. it, it was really hard to get any kind of knowledge or any kind of learning. And so I, I would say nowadays, a lot of the resources you can find either from like digital classes or from like uh, online help sessions or online forums, all those things kind of contribute. And so if I were to do something now, I might go to school for maybe like a class or two, uh, but overall, I would say most of the information could be you know done digitally or online or through another uh, form of media. Gotcha, cool. And then for you, Kurt, when did the the art journey begin for you? Well, um, I was the same as Clinton, just doing like drawing and stuff as a kid, and I just started. I remember I started like just tracing things over, and then just starting freehand drawing like pencil and paper. Unfortunately, uh, there's no undo button on paper yeah. so i just dropped that pretty quick um yeah. and then so i started doing um i went to university after high school and i was doing uh, a double major in political science and international studies with a minor Damn. in labor studies and then <laughs> uh, i was doing that for four years and i was like yeah never mind and then i just oh. on a whim applied to um an art program here in vancouver and then okay. it was a one-year program at bcit that's the British Columbia Institute of Technology. And mm -hmm. then uh, after that one-year program, I was done. And then I just got a job at uh, EA Vancouver. Wow. Just like that, huh? Well, <laughs> I'm that sounds like a very <laughs> smooth transition. But, uh, go but um, yeah, so go. it was a one-year program. And I basically just uh, lived at that school. And okay. I was just doing that basically nonstop, like uh, seven days a week. And I was... Um, I'd wake up, I'd go to school for 10, and I'd catch the last bus at like 1.20 home, mm -hmm. and then I would just do that every day. And I just wow. like ate the same like little meals and stuff. Luckily, I had um, my partner supporting me the whole time, so I was able to focus on that. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so after the year was done, yeah, I guess the rest is history. Now, like um, with your classmates and peers uh, while you're going to that art program, um, did they work as hard as you? or? You just really was in it to win it. Um, yeah, I went pretty hard. I think, <laughs> like going into it, I kind of looked and I realized like the placement rate, like out of that program, was uh, probably like ten percent. And that, so mm -hmm. there was like twenty five students. So I was like, two and a half people are going to get jobs. And uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so. I hate, I hate to then, work with the half of the person. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> don't recommend it. But it's um, like, so uh, then yeah. basically, <laughs> basically, yeah, so only two and a half, rounded up to three people got jobs. And uh, <laughs> so luckily I was one of them. But with that sort of program, it really depends. Like the work that you put in will, you know, yeah. kind of pay off and multiply. So, um, yeah, I think that if I had to, like, do it again, I definitely would. Um, but mm -hmm. I think with so many resources, like a huge part of me going to that school was not, wasn't just like doing the program because it was only one year and it was also like animation, compositing and like all this other stuff that I didn't really care about. There's only like mm -hmm. two classes that were like modeling and texturing. So then I just kind of like outsourced my work to my animation friend and stuff like that. And I did his modeling homework. Don't tell anyone that mm -hmm. might be a secret, but, okay. um, and so then <laughs> I just focused on that and then I uh, like would just spend time on poly count and like CG society and stuff like that. Just trying to get mm -hmm. like as much information as possible. So I I'd say like now, especially in the recent years, there's been a lot of like really good online courses cropping up and stuff. So um, I'd say the, the way to view like school is kind of just like an experience boost, I guess. Like you can learn it like on your own time at home. But I think, you know, like getting that XP boost and talking to someone about it and yeah. bouncing ideas off them and stuff helps you learn faster. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, like the collective um, mentality, you know, sharing information between like minded individuals, propelling you to a greater yeah. good. I'd yeah. say the biggest resource as well, like going to that school, was just um, interfacing with the teacher who is two teachers in particular who are like part of the industry and like working 
like five days a week in the studios and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. just being able to like work and talk with them and just uh, basically once I graduated, just bug them until they hired me was uh, oh, invaluable. Okay. So, yeah. So, so you did take the track of um, you were already focused on, you knew what you wanted to do right after school. You wanted to get into texturing. Um, yeah. Like after the 3D school, yeah. Like I actually went into the program thinking I was going to do animation and then I mm -hmm. uh, did one keyframe and I didn't like it. So then I just switched. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> too much. It was like curves and stuff like that. No. Yeah, I was like, nah. Um, <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah, we hate doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And and how how was the school um, with their resources in in terms of like providing information for students on the transition from school to getting a job, uh, like job boards and whatnot? Were they pretty open? Um, yeah, I think so. I think like there were some teachers that were sort of out of school or out of the industry for a bit longer. So they had a bit or like from film and stuff like that. So um, it was a healthy mix of like full time teachers and stuff like that. And everyone had like varying perspectives, which were all valuable. OK, cool. And, and like I for said, you, just, Clint, oh. yeah. Oh, Richard, sorry. Was that again? I didn't want to cut oh, you off. And like right, I Kurt. said, just having those teachers like that I could talk to after I graduated and like keep getting feedback and stuff. That was the biggest thing. Yeah, definitely. The power of mentorship. Yeah, is, exactly. Uh, definitely a key. So, and then for you, Clinton, um, was the the transition from going to school to breaking into the industry? How was it? Was it straightforward, or did it have its own set of challenges? <laughs> Ooh, wee, it was tough. Um, yeah, I I probably sent off. I sent off. I think. I think I sat down and counted after. I think I sent off 115 uh, applications to anything. Like basically like when I got done with school, I was like, okay, I know I want to model and I know I want to texture and I know I want to do games eventually, but I know I might not be able to get into that right away. So anything to get myself in the door. And so um, I, the first, I think the first kind of exposure I got that helped me out was I entered a contest on 3D Motive, uh, back when they had like a, like their first contest when they first opened. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I won that. And so I got really lucky with getting a lot of exposure from that. And so right after that, I, I had um, I had an interview with a car company in Germany and then a, uh, a company in Alabama that made uh, 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 like army development video games. And so while yeah. the car company in Germany sounded really cool, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do games, I should just do games. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I was like, I was kind of hesitant because I was like, you know, moving away from like people that you care about, like, you know, anything like that, you're going to find that you're going to need to do that most likely for any of your first jobs. It's just something that kind of comes with the territory. And so I moved to Alabama and I took that job with the Army Game Studio. And I was only there for about maybe about nine or 10 months um, before I landed another job in San Francisco. So that kind of was what got me into the into the position right away to just kind of get get my foot in the door, get some exposure, um, just get some time learning the process and the pipeline, and that, that kind of would help me get in. So you'd say back then you you kind of approach it from a generalist generalist point of view. Yeah, um, because at the, your portfolio at the, was. Yeah, at the time, um, like when I left SCAD, it was the game program was still relatively new, like it had only been in effect a few years, and so. I think a lot of people were still quite not quite sure on how to kind of position your portfolio to make sure that you get into the right thing. Like there wasn't as many specialists back then. Like there wasn't like mm -hmm. you wouldn't find many texture artists. You wouldn't find many like um, I guess like substance designer artists or things like you know like really specialist things that you have now like foliage artists things like that. Back then it was mm -hmm. basically your character your character artist or your environment artist. And someone sometimes that was even blurred. So. Um, it was a lot more of a general approach back then, for sure. Okay, and then how long were you in San Francisco? Uh, San Francisco, I was there for I think, I think almost three years, um, and I worked at a at a studio there um, that started as a mobile game company, and then they actually transitioned into be one of the first um, uh, like beta testers for Unreal Four Engine, uh, and they started oh. to make a, a tank game that was like kind of like World of Tanks before all that stuff came mm -hmm. out, and so. Sure. Um, it was it was pretty fun to work on, and um, San Francisco is an awesome city to live in. Um, but yeah, that was that was kind of my first real exposure to like 
really being into AAA kind of game development cycles. And how and how was um, so was it com competitive the rates uh, in San Francisco while you were there? Uh, well, there? yeah. When I when I was in Alabama, it was a lot different, right? Because you're in a small city, and so the the rates are going to mm -hmm. be much less. So I I'd only lived in small cities most of my life, so I hadn't really had exposure to how much I should be asking for, and there wasn't a lot of that information online yet because like Glassdoor and stuff like that were were just kind of emerging. They weren't really popular or really like filled out yet and so trying to find out how much you should be paid per city was a really daunting task um mm. i was really lucky and i worked with really nice people and i asked for something at first that was way less than i should have asked for mm -hmm. and so when mm -hmm. i got there I, I was there for about about two months and i went to my art director and i said hey man like i'm having a really hard time when, when, I, when i when i first got to san francisco i wanted it so bad i, ha I think i had maybe $20 in my bank account because I had to sell everything to get to there. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> I was really, I was really determined to make it work. And when I got there, sure. like I said, it just, you kind of discover that certain cities cost a lot more. And San Francisco is a very, very expensive city. It's probably one of the most expensive. Oh, I, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so, here in California. So I, I totally get the whole <laughs> expensiveness. For sure. Um, yeah. Luckily for me, I'm up in Sacramento area, so we don't get too much of it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. If you're in the Bay Area or anywhere just within proximity of the Bay Area, you're looking up at very high li uh, living costs, cost of living, and also, of course, in SoCal. Definitely. And then, so from there on, yeah. And then it was just something to add on to that. Um, I remember an old podcast episode by Alan McKay, where he mm -hmm. talks about rates and whatnot, and he mentions, yeah, if you're get going into the interview and then that question pops up, one of the good uh questions to send back to them would be you know what's the budget you know and just get an idea of what they're willing to pay cuz cuz both of you going into that interview you you both know you have you know i guess uh cards to bring to the table so it's kind of like back and forth but uh yeah once you establish that conversation i think uh things go smooth yeah, for sure. And like I said, when I got there, like I, I was really lucky and I had like a really nice team and it was a good company. And I asked for a raise like two months in and they they helped me out to kind of get me back on track to where I needed to be. Uh, but that doesn't always happen, right? Like usually your first time is your only time for the first year at least. So it's always better to kind of figure out that price range before, you know, relatively before you go in or at least have an idea. And then like you said, mm -hmm. kind of ask what the budget is. is a good idea for sure. Sure. And then from San Francisco, you went up north already? Uh, no, actually, from, from San Francisco, I went to uh, down to Austin, Texas for a little bit, and I worked with Bethesda uh, Game Studio there for a little while. Um, and then uh, I was there for about, I think about a year, maybe a year and a quarter. And then um, I had a friend that I had gone to college with um, that was up in Vancouver, and he was working with Microsoft, and he had suggested um, they needed another environment artist up here. And so I, um, I was like, I was like, man, I've always wanted to work on Gears of War. Like, this is like a dream job. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's give it a try. So like, I liked working at Bethesda and everything, but I just, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. And I'd always wanted to move up to Canada because I really liked, I liked when I visited when I was younger. So mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, this is a great opportunity to do this. So I, I came up here and I actually interviewed with Kurt. Kurt was one of the people that interviewed me when I first started. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I and yeah, and I was late because I, yeah. I, I went to the wrong building because there's multiple Microsoft buildings in Vancouver. That's funny, yeah, because I was like, hey, man, why were you late? And then I just didn't hear what he said. And so I just was like, <laughs> oh, and I pretended to hear. And then when they asked, like, why Clinton was late, I was like, uh, he had a pretty good reason. I forget what it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> And that, uh, that established a lifelong yeah. friendship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got my back from the beginning. Yeah, totally. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, would you, would, for both of you guys, would you agree that later in your career, I mean, once you guys are, you've broken into the industry, it's it's more so friends' recommendation. Oh yeah, way. for sure. It's, yeah, it's just, definitely totally. helpful. Like it's just getting your foot in the door. The biggest thing with the industry is like, people just don't want to work with jerks, right? So, sure. um, if if I'm working with Clinton, and then he says, "Hey, I know this guy, and he's not a jerk," I'll be like. All right, sweet. It's like halfway there. So, there you go. yeah, it makes it easier. Yeah, it's totally true. And if someone is known as a jerk, man, it's like it gets around because the industry is so small. Like if, if you know someone that's not, not fun to work with or just like really hard to get along with, it's like people know like 
every studio I've, I've been at, like if I've known anyone that was hard to get along with, everyone already knew that person. Like they're oh, like, Oh wow. yeah, I worked with that guy way back at EA or I worked with that guy like way long ago at this studio. And so it's like, yeah. it's just, it's really, it's really about how, like once you get your foot in the door, it's just really about just like having a good personality and like really just being a, like a team player. Totally. Cause I think like in the industry, at least in AAA development, cause everyone moves around so much. I mean, there's less than like, this is a guess, but less than like 1500 artists. Right. So it's mm -hmm. super easy for people to overlap and stuff like, especially like mm -hmm. in sort of mainstream, like AAA development. So for sure. For sure. And then Kurt, when uh, you left EA, where you, did you go straight to um, the, the coalition? Yeah. Yep. So I went to the coalition and then I was working on that game. And then I went to Montreal actually, and I worked on Star Wars Battlefront two. And then I was there for a year. And then um, my cool. partner and I decided that um, Montreal wasn't for us. And then I actually just came back to Vancouver. Okay. Yeah. And how big is the, um, how many studios are out there in your area? In Vancouver? Yeah. Mm-hmm. In terms of like game and mixture of what not. Yeah, I think there's like only a few AAA studios. Yeah, there's all well, the Coalition, Capcom, EA, and then there's smaller ones, eh, Clint? Like uh, Blackbird yeah. and stuff. Yeah, like Blackbird Interactive and stuff. And I, I know I just read an article yesterday that said actually Vancouver is the fastest growing VR market uh, in North wow. America. So like and that was something. I think, yeah, for sure. Go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Oh, yeah, no, it, no. Was, it, it said it was only <laughs> over already 50, uh, 50 studios here that were just concentrating on VR market. Okay, yeah, and that just got me excited because I, <laughs> I wanted to touch on VR because uh, I'm getting really curious about it too. I'd, I'd really love to get a hand on either the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift. Um, so, what kind of hardware were you guys using? Uh, were you on Vive or uh, Oculus? Oh, we we uh, we personally were not using like when we've oh, me and Kurt okay. have worked on VR projects, but like I'm just saying like Vancouver is the fastest growing VR market. Okay, but even with your uh, VR projects, did you? So th those ever get those yeah. Go ahead. So so both me and Kurt have uh, like PlayStation VR, and we've messed with VR before, and okay. we've done like VR trade shows and stuff. And we've had a lot of experience with just like personally using it. Uh, me and Kurt have also worked on con like freelance contracts together where we worked in VR, but that VR was tested in their studio, so it wasn't so much on our end for that kind of thing. I see, and it's just more um, like 360 development um, or immersive environments and whatnot. Yeah, so like with VR, it's a lot more optimization because everything has to run at 90 frames a second. So it's a lot more just really keeping a a really tight like like kind of just like schedule and how you. Um, kind of plan out your entire environment to make sure, you know, budgets are all within spec. And you know, then, I mean, like basically like your textures aren't super over res and just basically a lot more tighter corners you have to make sure you keep comparatively to like mm -hmm. regular AAA game development. Sure. And on the topic of VR, something I saw really cool lately, it's been already released, but uh, ILMX Lab was working on The Void. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with that. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of really good games coming out like that. And I know, um, how, what's it called? Ready at Dawn just came out with that one not too long ago. I still want to try that one. That, that one looked really good. Echo, there's, there's so many, yeah. Yeah, Echo, yeah. So there's so many good games coming out. I feel like I feel like that market like really has taken off and a lot of really good work is coming out. It's just only a matter of time before it's basically like back to the par of what we are now, now with like visual refinement where it's like basically as good looking as a AAA game, to, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I thought what was so impressive about the ILM project was that um, they had they set up these, uh, basically, it's kind of like a little mini warehouse, and it was all tactile. So mm -hmm. you would wear the headset, and then you'd move through the environment, and it was all, yeah, you were in the Star Wars universe, per se. So that's it's definitely cool. so exciting. It's like, so it's like you can actually like experience it firsthand. That's really neat. Yeah, and you could feel it. So like, say there's a um, like a lever or whatnot, you could actually pull it down. Um, you had your blasters with you. Yeah, definitely super hyper. Awesome. I guess they call it hyper VR. VR. Yeah. So it's cool. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for you, Kurt, uh, maybe we could talk about what's like a, a day for you at the coalition. In a general sense, what are your responsibilities as a book development and an environment artist? 
Um, so if the it depends, like I kind of put on a couple different hats. So um, the first is just um, creating assets and stuff like that based on concept or with no concept and um, problem solving and that sort of thing. Uh, the second is if there's something that is sort of like an unknown visual look or we're not totally sure how we're going to like execute on that style or something like that, then um, part of that is just kind of brainstorming and talking with like the other departments like uh, lighting and tech art and the level art teams and stuff and just trying to find a solution that works for everyone. And it's a lot of getting out of your chair and just, like I said, talking and problem solving. And then um, kind of after that, once I sort of have a plan, then I'll uh, start to work on that, whether it be like modeling and texturing or uh, creating shaders and materials in Unreal Engine. Cool, and then for you, Clinton, how's the day like for you as a principal artist? Sure, so yeah, um, as a principal artist, it's, it's kind of the same. So uh, because uh, I was, used to be at Coalition with Kurt doing, doing this uh, same kind of task he was doing, and then uh, with the principal artist role, the studio I'm at now, Midwinter, um, is a lot smaller. Like it's like only, I think, 25 people currently. Um, and so it's a really, really small studio compared to, you know, being at the coalition where um, there was a lot more specialists and a lot more roles. So with that, um, I would say at midwinter, it's more of just like, it's a lot of prototyping. It's a lot of like, basically like building everything from start to finish. So basically it's like, if you have an idea, like talk about your idea with the group, kind of like flesh it out, like uh, through a design doc or however you want to do it and then just kind of you know go through the, the steps a through z to basically be like okay i want to design this building i want it to be destructible here's how i want it to be destructible here's how i want it to look and then kind of just like going through you know all those phases basically all the way to kind of like a shippable quality product wow yeah and what's interesting is you said that you were working remote mm -hmm. so um is that a uh, something that's that's doesn't seem too common in the industry no, or is it yeah. That's not very common at all. Um, that's something that um, with Midwinter that it was kind of a, uh, I guess it was kind of like a special uh, circumstance in that I really didn't want to leave Vancouver. I really like Canada. I really I like being around my friends like Kurt, <laughs> and so <laughs> I I was like I don't want to I don't want to leave quite yet. And I just moved here right. a few years ago, um, and so I had moved a lot just because like when you're working in games, it happens so often that you have to move, and so. I was like, I want to take this opportunity to really stay somewhere for a little while and really get to know the city a little bit more. And so mm -hmm. because of that and talking to Midwinter and kind of expressing that to them, they were really open to allowing me to do that. Um, but I think it takes a, a particular type of person because some people have like the, some people like going into a studio and like sitting down with everyone and like like that experience where everyone's around them. And I, I, I like that experience uh, too, but I also don't mind like, Kind of being like on my own sometimes and kind of working through ideas um but i i'm on skype pretty much like all day with them so like it's not like mm -hmm. it's a it's too much of a difference i'm just like just not there physically even though i'm i basically sure. can talk to anyone at any moment so it's just a different setup but um kind of the same thing and then as you're working remote um do you match your hours to the studio yeah so uh yeah, so I, I wake up a little bit earlier. So like, I think the studio generally starts work around like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Um, most of people get there. I try to start around like 8, 8.15, sometimes 8.30. Um, just try to start a little bit earlier. Um, but that's just basically so like, I, I kind of like, uh, I, I use that to kind of enjoy how I've, I've set up my day to be remote. So say for instance, I want to go to the gym. I want to go for a walk. I want to do, you know, get a, get a coffee break. I'm not as like refined to like being like the nine to five because as long as I'm getting my tasks done and I, and they're you know they're trusting me to get the work that I've agreed to get done within the amount of time, then everyone's happy, right? Like I can go take mm -hmm. a break for maybe an hour or so, do something I need to do, then come back home and then get back to work. Cool. And then over at the coalition, Kurt, uh, is it pretty straightforward nine to five? Yeah. So there's uh, core hours between ten to four, so you can kind of work on either side of that. So if you show up at 10, you're like, you stay till six, or you could show up at like, uh, I don't know the other hours because I never do it. I think like <laughs> seven to four. <laughs> That's math, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So as long as you're working within those core hours and you're working an eight hour day, then you're good. Okay, cool. And then what about like, do you guys have crunch though? Crunch times? Yeah, I think that's inevitable in the industry. Yeah, that's that's at every and, and what's the what's the day? Yeah, like uh, 
looking outside in, how how does a crunch week schedule look like? Is it pretty hectic or you can usually tell it's coming when a producer's like, <laughs> so we're all adults and we need to get our tasks done. And so I'm not <laughs> saying like <laughs> I'm not saying that we need to do overtime yet, but if you feel like you're not getting your stuff done, just talk to someone. Or you can stay, but it's totally optional. And then you're like, oh man, the storm's coming. So um <laughs> <laughs> yeah so true but yeah it's, it's yeah. nice though like they pay for meals i guess so that's cool oh good yeah yeah so that'll be another thing to talk about what are the perks of working at the coalition then uh, uh what free else drinks besides, right off the top okay free chocolate mm -hmm. milk free pop you know yeah uh <laughs> free bananas um yeah beers of war every two weeks that's cool and we get that. free fridays so on like the last uh Last Friday of every week, we get a day just to basically improve our skills or investigate oh, wow. something or try something new that we want to do. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of really cool like projects can come out of that. Uh, okay, it's so it's cool working with like a really great team and uh, working on a fun project. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh no, I was just going to mention. So do do they bring in maybe like some guest uh, workshops or guest speakers and all that? Mm -hmm. No, it's not no. like a conscious effort. Sometimes, like uh, the guys from Allegrithmic just came uh, last month or something just to talk to us and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's a cool. happens on occasion. And then, what are your perks? <laughs> I think we already covered that, Glenn, and uh, yeah. being in like a freelance position that you have a lot of freedom. I guess you could say. Yeah, I think just the the, the flexibility that you get in the day. Uh, I get to stay in my pajamas all day. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I get to sit hang out with my dogs at home. That's <laughs> those are the kind of perks uh, that I get with with, with midwinter. Um, but <laughs> I think I think overall, like they they like you know allow me to come down to the studio in Seattle, and they they take care of me when I'm down there to like make sure my travel is taken care of and stuff like that. And they're just they've been really accommodating to make sure that like you know if I want to come down and work for a little bit there and then come back here, you know, like they're, they're always open to that. I think I think the perks are like. Just the personability of it. It's very, it's very small, so it's very personal. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Ruzi had a, an interesting question. Uh, there's no address code at the coalition, as Kurt mentioned. But I had a question about okay, when the for interviews and whatnot, um, what's what's the 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 fail safe attire? Jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah, jeans oh, and really? a t-shirt. Oh wow. really? Uh, yeah. Was, maybe maybe a collared shirt at most, most, but okay. like. I remember when I first started, somebody told me like, they're like, oh, you're not going to wear a tie and like a suit. And I'm like, I, I guess, I don't know, should I? And then like after yeah. talking to teachers, people were like, no, that'll weird out game developers because nobody wears that yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I don't know. I heard this story about one of the guys at Blur. Um, I guess someone came in with, uh, it was all you know, dressed to the 10, had a mm -hmm. suit and tie. Yeah. He was a, you know, a kind of a joke for the day. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like it's just it's just not it's, it's just such a casual like atmosphere when you're at that, you know, when you're working in any game studio. And so it's like it's just out of sights to see something like that unless you're like a manager or a producer to wear something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I think most of us attend these webinars are either in the category of leveling up our portfolio to break into the industry or get closer to our dream jobs. In your opinion, what are ways that junior artists can exercise their eyes for shading and texturing? Uh, sorry, what was that? I was thinking about wearing pajamas oh. to work. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we can jump to that question too. Can you wear no, pajamas? just just uh, dreaming about it. it. I don't know. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> well, the, the question, yeah, so the question revolves, it's uh, more of an advice for junior environment artists or texture artists, but what are like some exercises you guys do to um, get better at texturing and shading? So I think with uh, texturing, like it's just, uh, it's important to just kind of focus on like, if you're like, oh, I want to do like a wood floor, just um, focus on that and just like really pay attention to the subtleties and stuff. I think when you're learning and trying to improve your skills and stuff, um, don't get caught too much on like time and how long it takes to make things or whatever. Focus more on like just trying to execute on like that look. And if it looks good, that's better than like 
it being done like half a day or whatever. So I definitely just recommend like smaller exercises, just kind of piecemeal, because then you can do a variety of different things faster without kind of getting bogged down in one big scene. Right. And do you shoot your own reference? Or yeah, sometimes. Just... Okay. Uh, like Clint, we were doing a scene A where uh, we went out and just shot reference of like a um, bunch, like yeah. a mansion things. So. Yeah. So yeah, we we had we had two projects that we worked on together um, this last year. That uh, one was an alley and one was a mansion. And so uh, we basically just like went out during our lunches at Coalition and just like went out for an hour, just walked around with our phones and took you know a bunch of reference around the city and like of buildings around town. And that really helped us kind of get an idea of what we wanted to do with the project. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And you think that that's beneficial compared to say like uh, using Pinterest and then Googling it. But if you're not yeah. familiar how the object looks like in real life, you may mm -hmm. treat the rendering or the texturing in a different way. Yeah. So like um, when I was at Motive and I was um, doing a lot of photogrammetry trips and stuff, it was really helpful to actually go to like the locations. And so um, we traveled around a bunch and not just to like do the photogrammetry and capture everything, but just see the atmosphere and like, you know, sort of feel that heat or like feel um, and just kind of see how everything kind of meshes together in context of the world instead of like, because you don't really see that just through a 2D photo, right? Sure. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And um, also both of you do have experience with environments and stuff. Um, how do you like to um, add personality into your environments? Is it just through doing it oftentimes mileage or do you still use some sort of a uh, reference gathering? Uh, you like a certain composition and you apply it to the, uh, the overall scene. Um, I think uh, a couple of things that I like, um, and I talk about this a lot in my class is that uh, I always like to think of like, it, first off, like the history of what I'm trying to do. Like I'm, I'm big on like, understanding the context of of the history of like how the environment has come to the place that you're show, displaying it at so like how old is it like what you know what weather has been here like who's been here like what's the, what's the understanding of the overall background um and that's the first thing i usually do and i usually usually spend a lot of time on pinterest and and other places getting reference for that um and then i also for my personal scenes i typically will like pick a um like a three color palette or a two color palette that i really am into and I'll usually use that for kind of my focus for the entirety of uh, most of the work I do. Cool. And then also for you, Kurt, um, how do you approach your environments? Yeah, so I really like um, kind of that layered storytelling, kind of like what Clint was saying, um, and just having like, because a lot of people just like, you know, we'll think about a scene, but then it's cool to think about like, oh, a hundred years ago, people were here, but then like 500 years ago, people were here and stuff like that. So um, just having those little storytelling elements are pretty cool. And just thinking about like, um, like blocking out lighting and stuff like that quickly, because I used to just like model things and then not really think of them in the context of the whole environment and stuff. So doing a lot of research and prep work beforehand helps. Good. And then do both of you guys have any daily rituals that help sharpen your skill set? Uh, uh, I just check on ArtStation then get stressed out about how good everyone is. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly right. That's, exactly that's pretty right. much it. That's, okay. <laughs> that's it. Huh? That's the key. Huh? Just... <laughs> uh, no. Well, most of it's, I mean, for you guys, especially you're working um, professionally. So that's, that's most of your day. So any left energy spent in the evenings is what do you like to do if you can at least um could contribute to uh, helping uh, uh, evolving your skill if you for can sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i've actually found that um i really like photography and i've been getting more into that lately um because it mm -hmm. kind of helps me think more about composition and colors and framing and things like that uh which are valuable skills to have sure yeah most definitely, yeah, I was going to bring up photography. Um, I do a little bit of photography, too. But I think um, just by doing it, uh, A, when you capture the object that you're you know, looking at, right, uh, you, you, you see it through your camera, but you also see it through your own camera, which is your eye. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a discrepancy there, because what your camera takes, it can't capture both the exposures, 
So you may be overexposing yeah. or underexposing, but the minute you develop that mental image, then you can go back to your photo reference and then adjust accordingly. Yeah, so, so that's like when doing photography and stuff, like I try to think about, you know, how it looked in my mind's eye and recreating that in an image instead of just uh, taking a photo, right? Like capturing it with for the, sure. like the colors and the feel and the tone and atmosphere and all that. For sure, for sure. Cool. And then uh, maybe we'll jump a little bit into questions, but we'll have a Q&A later. Um, but Chris had a pretty good question. Uh, do students, uh, for Clinton, for your class, do students pick the concepts for themselves or do you have a specific criteria for choosing um, one? No, yeah, it's completely open to students. I. I I find that it's like kind of boring to work on something that like if everyone's given the same concept and also like how good of a portfolio builder is that? It's not very good. Like if everyone has the same like train or something. And so yeah. I always say like everyone just pick whatever you want, but I have a few criteria that I do try to help. Uh, I think that do, it does help to kind of reel students in from getting too far out there. And that's basically like, I typically suggest to do something based on realistic um, as uh, something sci-fi or something kind of abstract or something stylized is a bit harder to do as it takes a bit more time to refine the the kind of look dev and the style for that. So that can that can eat into a lot of the time. And the class is more about understanding the the workflow and the the kind of process and the the way you want to think about how you're constructing your scene. And so you don't want to be spending so much time that you're you're thinking about like the art direction that you can't focus on like how, how the pipeline works. You know. Um, and then the other thing I always tell students is that. You you kind of you want to keep it small and contained. Like, I, I always give students the benefit of the doubt. I'm say like, if somebody will come in and they'll say, I'm going to build this castle with this dragon and this moat and this like giant forest in the background. And I'm like, okay, like if that's what you want to do. And then like week one will go by and I'll say like, okay, now look at your work. How much do you feel like you got done? Like how much? How far do you yeah. feel like you are? And whatever that is, now cut it in half. And then for the first three weeks, I tell students every that every time they'll be like, oh, I couldn't quite get this done. And I'm like then we should cut it in half. Like always think about like ways to like cut it in half to make it presentable, make it good, make it strong, make it interesting for your portfolio, but not make it so overwhelming that you can't get it done. Yeah, good, 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 good. And yeah, that, that brings us to um, the class summaries. And once again, on behalf of CGMA, we're both thrilled to have you teaching next term. So you kind of went over your uh, overall um, week outline Mm -hmm. And is there anything else you'd like to share in terms of, you know, incoming students taking this class, which students would benefit the most? Um, sure. So I think um, I think a lot of questions I get is like, OK, I use Substance or I use uh, Quixel or I use Maya or I use, you know, whatever software. The software in this class does not necessarily matter. I use Maya. I use Quixel, I use Substance, and um, I use like ZBrush and some other things. But like, don't feel like that is like a deterrent from this class because basically the class is more about the theory of it and understanding the process. And all the kind of things I go over in class could pretty much be, you know, like treated as if they were applicable to any kind of software package you're going to be using. And so. A lot of students are kind of wondering like, okay, well, should I not take it because I don't want to learn Quixel or I do want to learn Quixel or whatnot? Like take mm -hmm. it, it, like it doesn't really matter. Like I, I always do like a like a live demo of, I, I do have a one class that talks more about Quixel, but then I, that, that very, um, that Q and A that happens right after that class, I typically do a demo on substance. So either way, you're going to learn something that you probably didn't know before and it's going to increase your skill set and also just kind of push you into that next st step of understanding on how to kind of create modular scenes. Um, cool. And then, the, and, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, go ahead. Yeah, finish what you're saying. I was going to say, the other thing I was going to say is that um, a lot of students are kind of curious on like, what's the difference between this and like a typical um, environment art class? Uh, and I would say that this is more about like understanding the actual like modular design. Like we're not going to go over like things like foliage as much or like um, things that are more of like one-off things like props. It's more about like understanding like how to build larger spaces uh, while saving texture space and like doing it in a, in, a, in a pipeline that's actually used in the AAA industry. Right. And just to add on to that, um, for those who are not familiar with modular uh, design, what are the pros and cons, or, or just basically the benefits of implementing modular environments. Sure. So like, uh, yeah, with, with modular kind of workflow, it's basically thinking about how you can 
essentially work smarter, not harder. So like a lot, a lot of environment artists come into this class and they've made props before, or they've you know made a small diorama before or something like that. Uh, and those most of those things, when they made them, they baked them, they textured them, they did them as all one-offs. Like it's all unique UV space or whatnot. This class is more about like understanding like how can I make a texture before I make the model? And then how can I kind of maneuver my model and my UVs to work with my texture to make it easier on myself in the long run. Like how can I reduce the amount of textures I'm generating from like 20 to 30 down to 10 for the entire environment? Like it's just ways to think smarter and not harder about like constructing larger scale environments. Perfect. And then for you, Kurt, you'll be teaching texturing and shading for games. Could yep. you go elaborate on your course? Yeah, so the course is more focused on um, like the material editor in Unreal. And so we're mainly looking at like um, just making uh, prop materials and making parameters and things like that to expose. So you can like tune things in the engine on the fly and stuff like that. And then sort of one-off things like um, we'll look at like doing vertex blending and like uh, we'll look at like time and uh, manipulating time to like, uh, you know, make like hologram shaders and stuff like that. And so the class is only six weeks as opposed to 10. And um, a lot of people want to come in and like, they will be asking about like learning substance designer or a painter or anything like that. And so uh, we can go over all that stuff too. Um, and it's, for me, it's like, I'm mainly focused on the Unreal side, but like the more you put in and the more questions you have about different softwares and stuff, I'm totally open to talk about that stuff too. Great, and for both your classes, um, students should be expected to have a basic knowledge of Unreal. Um, I think I I, I kind of start out pretty fundamentally. So, like, I would say I've had students that have just opened up Unreal the first time, maybe like two three weeks before the class, and just maybe just spent an, like an hour every few nights just learning a little bit about like the basic UI. But past that. Mm -hmm. I would say you probably could get along fine without knowing too much about uh, how kind of Unreal works. I think it's more important to know just um, how game art works in general is the is a is a more key thing to know going into the class, um, and then you you should be fine just learning the engine a lot uh, along the way. And for you, Kurt, yeah, I'd a, say uh, the same. Yep. Like, um, I think my class is kind of a bit more like just focused on. Um, one thing, so I think knowing more about the game art, like the pipeline and the process and stuff is beneficial, but we do talk about like the basics and stuff as well, and we go over that. And there are like, a lot of my students have are like, hey, I, I've never looked at Unreal before and uh, go from there. Awesome. So we're near the end of our webinar. At this point, I'd like to open the floor to the audience for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please post it up in the chat, and I will relay it to Clinton and Kurt. OK, um, so actually, Rizzi has a question here, the male to female yep. employee ratio. So um, at the studio right now, we have, or on the environment team, which is a smaller team of like eight people, there's uh, two, yeah, two women. And then, so that's, that's pretty good. 25 yeah, percent i mean I'd it could always be than, yeah it, it could always be better but um i think uh it's improving does it only run uh once a year no the courses run four times a year um sometimes depending on the instructor uh they might take a a, uh, a quarter off but typically four times a year the classes run yeah same for me yeah that's good Okay, so let's go back. Uh, um, whoa, 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 hold on. <laughs> okay, so M is asking <laughs> how in demand okay. is a specialist versus a generalist. Yeah. So I would say that um, in my experience, um, if you want to do AAA, it's more beneficial to be like more specialized because typically when you're working in a AAA studio, they want like, you know, like specialists in a specific thing, right? And um, like Clint could probably. Uh, speak more to this, but at a smaller indie studio, it's better to like, it's always beneficial to know about lighting and stuff like that. But at an indie studio, you'll be flexing more of those like different muscles. 
For sure, yeah. I think yeah, I think he's exactly right. It's like the bigger the studio, the more specialists you'll have. The smaller the studio, the more you're kind of required to to be a generalist and to kind of know things like blueprints or like lighting or like things that or material workflows and like tech stuff that you wouldn't normally have like maybe get to do as much at a at a larger studio just because like there's so much content that's being made at a larger studio you kind of have to kind of focus on what your task is specifically good uh sean asks how do you see automation procedural environment generation impacting your work in the near far term uh oh do you mean like I guess like does that mean like I guess like mega scans or like uh, procedural automation automation like substance with, like, and stuff like substance and stuff like that? Or I are you say... talking more? Oh, sorry. Go 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 ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, or are you talking more like um, Horizon Zero Dawn and how they procedurally populated their entire worlds? Or like Wildlands or like stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I would. I think so. It... Programs AI. Oh, like deep learning and stuff. Um... I don't know. I think that's a bit too far off. I think, like, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a reality with Horizon, but I mean, the sort of fantasy of just being able to say, like, draw on a piece Make of paper, her. like, mountain, forest, blah blah blah, and then AI just populates and makes it look nice. I think that's yeah. pretty far off. But in the near term, I think um, it's just beneficial because yeah. making games is expensive nowadays. I would say, if anything, in the near term, don't focus on learning a bunch about like foliage and trees and rocks. <laughs> Nah. <laughs> Those are the things that are being automated really quickly. Like with mega scans and everything else, like it's like it's just happening so fast that it, that's going to be one of the first thing I feel like that's gobbled up by automation for sure. I think also just kind of to counteract that, just becoming a bit more technical and being able to mm -hmm. talk that language and stuff will help a lot. Definitely. Awesome. Xander asks, what's your favorite part of the job? I'll let Kirk go first. Oh, OK. <laughs> so my favorite part is uh, problem solving, getting up and talking to people. And um, you know, just it really makes me feel like you know, we're part of, we're on a ship together, and we're uh, sailing towards uh, profits, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the I like, and making a cool game. <laughs> Great ship profit. I like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I would say, uh, I would say probably similar. I would say when it comes to um, a smaller studio, I think what I really liked that um, the reason why I went to Midwinter is that uh, when I was working in San Francisco and working with uh, Kixai and a bunch of people there, I really liked the small kind of refined um, studio that you get when it's it's more a tight knit group. And so, and also like the amount of flexibility you have to like really get to do a bunch of stuff and i really enjoy that part of the process where like if i don't like how the lighting looks here or i have a suggestion on how to fix this blueprint or you know whatever like i can get into that where it's like i felt like before i was a little bit more you know like i'm doing this kind of one task on a daily basis and so it really just depends on what kind of atmosphere you're you're going for um but i would say like one thing that I don't get as much of that I do miss that I really did like about uh, working at the coalition. That was one of my favorite parts of the job is that the, just the office humor and just like the people around mm. you, like just really developing that camaraderie between you and your, your, your people around you. It's like you develop really strong, close ties. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a huge thing as well. Yeah, I agree. It's been quiet since Clint left. <laughs> uh oh, oh sad face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, Charles asks, would you say a level design position is a more specialized position or a fairly essential position in medium slash big studios? Yeah, I mean, level design, I think, is like the core. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, the, they find the fun in the game, right? Uh, and then level art, uh, yeah, I'd say that's still super essential. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Cool. Ruzi asked for portfolios, what should and should nots are uh, to include, especially for environment art? Let's cater this to, say, for a game portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the biggest thing I always tell my students is to focus on uh, micro and macro. And what that means is, like, when I look at a portfolio, I want to see that you have micro things, which is basically like props or, or textures or things that show you have a, a an attention to detail and you have a good refinement to um your artistic ability but i also want to see macro like i want to also understand that you can see the bigger picture you're not going to go spend like 
60 hours on this rock that's in the corner and in the shadow because like that's not really what's important in the, in the overall scene like you can you can look at the bigger picture to understand like what's really important here and for you kurt um yeah i'd say the same i think just being able to demonstrate that you know like physically based rendering um prop baking trim sheets tiling texture creation and then uh composition like would be like super beneficial if you're doing like level art and asset creation stuff. Yeah. Also, and just also to add to that. Oh, good. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead I was gonna say, and just like no. one big thing is that uh, uh, a lot of times it will turn people off immediately. And, and I've I've been in meetings with Kurt with we've looked at portfolios where it'll have this kind of stuff where it's like like normal map bake errors or like things that are just like really blatantly obvious like. Those things are like a killer. Like those things will get you off the table like right yeah. away because it's like, like mm. it just doesn't show you paid attention to detail or you like really cared enough to like really invest that time to make sure it was like up to snuff. Yeah, like having finished things, like if guys just have a bunch of stuff that is like, oh, work in progress study that I did in two hours of like a rock, and it's like another work in progress study that I did in two hours of like my keyboard and like just a series of unfinished things. Uh mm -hmm. you want to avoid that because uh, being able to see things through to completion and execute on, on them well yeah. is key. Yeah, artists are and just to add on to not that. be completionists. Right, and just to add on to that, how fast do you guys review portfolios? Uh, it's um, pretty quick. Yeah, like probably five minutes. Yeah, like per, you, per you'll usually, yeah, you'll usually know within the first like minute, but you'll kind yeah. of uh, it'll give people Dig the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, to be like, okay, maybe maybe this first thing I saw wasn't the best, but let's let's check out the other stuff. Got it. Cool. Um, Michelle asks, in games in particular, do you see specific software used over and over again, more popular than other software? Mm, I think not really. I think just demonstrating that you know the fundamentals of like sub-D modeling or sculpting and stuff, it doesn't matter then at that point if you're using Mudbox or Moto or Maya or anything, right? Just knowing that those higher level uh, sort of skills is more important to demonstrate. Okay. For sure. Yeah. And then Prathmesh asks, what is the difference between look dev for games and look dev for films? Real time real time and ray tracing got him confused. Yeah. So Kurt, you want to go? I guess that Yeah, sure. So um look dev for games is a lot of like working within the limitations that are given to you. It'll be like, hey, like let's make this cool looking ice, but you can't have translucency or subsurface. And then you have to work within those confinements. Whereas for film, uh, I can't speak to that personally, but I'd assume that it's uh, like they have less technical limitations. And time is more of a factor compared to uh, games because development on films is typically shorter. Yeah, it's 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 like, it's like um, the way to think about it is like when you're an environment artist, you're more of like, you're more in the production of like making the art. When you're a look dev artist, you're more into uh, establishing how the art is made and how it will function for um, other additional parties to help you make the art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Got it. So Robert asks, uh, where did I? Okay, hold on one second. You scroll up. Oh yeah. Um... This one, the a lot of AAA games using photogrammetry that's affecting texture artists. Um, yeah, I think that uh, photogrammetry is cool. I think it's hard to, you know, scale uh, because if you have experienced this where it's like, oh, I've we went and shot a bunch of things and we needed this one like rock or ground texture or whatever. And it's like, oh, dang, I missed like a couple photos and the pieces don't stitch together. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, I can't really fly back to Japan. So uh, I guess we can't use this. <laughs> so um, I, mean, you could. I think it's hard. I mean, you could <laughs> fly back. Got to convince your boss, which is a hard conversation. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, procedural stuff is still really strong in comparison to photogrammetry because it's a lot more scalable. Yeah. And I think I think games like um, like the Naughty Dog stuff. I think what you're able to achieve sometimes through your own uh, visual decision making is sometimes not um, as interesting as I mean, it's, it's more interesting than real life. Like 
sometimes when you decide to make a texture look this way or use this color palette, like that is way more interesting visually or more compelling or more uh, comprehensive in the scene comparatively to like, I took a picture of this rock and it's not quite what the kind of rock I want it to look like is. Yeah, you can stylize more. Yeah. Got it. Ruzi asks, for portfolio work, can I use mega scans or does everything have to be made from scratch? Uh, I would say you could use a mixture of both. I, 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 I'm not bothered by mega scans and portfolios as long as it's mentioned in the description. Like if I'm, if someone's like, yeah, I made this scene and I made, didn't make the tree in the background because I didn't, wasn't really important, really wasn't what I'm trying to focus on. then that's fine with me. Like I, I, I'm more interested about like the things that you did make and the, the composition that you're achieving. Yeah, totally. Just be honest about it. Yep. Mifflefish asks, do you feel there are certain must-know software for CG modelers to know? And if so, what are they? Um, I don't really know. I think just, like I said, knowing that you can sculpt and do high-poly models and stuff is yeah, uh, like more important ZBrush than any software. Or, yeah. ZBrush or sculpt trees or sculpt trees or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, Mudbox, any of those mm -hmm. things, as long as you understand how to use something. I think like obviously there's industry leaders like like ZBrush is kind of the king sculpting, but like mm -hmm. there's plenty of like really awesome character artists and stuff who just use Mudbox. So as long as you can demonstrate your quality, that's more important. Yeah. And I, I know tons of like environment artists that are kind of on the come up that I use Blender and it blows me away and I'm like, that's great, man. Like mm -hmm. whatever whatever you use, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like as long as you're 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 achieving that final result. Your final frame looks good, right? Yeah, that's all that matters. Nice. Renee asks, speaking of procedural world building, what are your opinions on learning and making stuff like that in Houdini for your portfolio as an environment artist? I think that's kind of niche. Like, yeah. I think it's a cool exercise, but um, like, if you're like, if I, I'm going to learn to use ZBrush or Houdini, like, you would obviously choose Houdini or no. Sorry, you would obviously choose ZBrush and then like choose like there's other things that you should be doing first, I think, before doing a Houdini stuff. That's kind of like icing on the cake. Yeah, it's it's a, it's more of an intermediate or advanced kind of learning uh, at that point. Like it's something that you're yeah, additionally learning to what you already know for your skill set. Um, but that being said, like I, I do know like that Houdini is definitely on the come up for what yeah. is is being used in the industry for more more and more things like um, I've used it very, very little, but uh, for what I did use it for, I was like, wow, this is so much better than what I could have done in another program. So it just depends on what you're using it for. I think guys like Hugo, Bayer are like really pushing the envelope and just kind of showing the rest of the industry like what can be done. And a lot of people are starting to pay more attention to that. For sure. Got it. Daniel Rias asks, do you think it's possible for someone to get hired as a AAA artist if their portfolio is split between characters and environments? Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, Rob, my, Rob got hired for that, right? Yeah, Rob got hired for that. And my yeah. portfolio um, was like a character, a car, and a couple props and stuff. And then I went in for an interview at EA, and I interviewed with both the environment team and the character team. And then I... Uh, they're like, cool, we're going to hire you. And then on my first day, I wasn't sure if I was doing character art or environment art because they didn't <laughs> make it clear. And so then they did environment art. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm an environment artist now. So there you go. Uh, yeah, I think it's less uh, less kind of common now because like Clint was saying, um, a lot of people are more specialized because it's a lot harder to be a good character artist and to be a good environment artist, but it's still possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of our so, one of our close friends, Rob, got had the same kind of thing where he came into a coalition with a portfolio split kind of between the two, um, and he had done mostly. Um, I think he had done mostly characters before that, um, and that was how how he got into it. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, say if you were applying, the position already says uh, environment artists, so you do have a portfolio that does have environment art. It doesn't hurt to add characters if you're no. good at it. Okay. No, because I mean, environments still have statues and stuff, and sometimes mm -hmm. like statues come in to, to the art team, and we're like getting a little nervous, and we're like, oh no. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's good. It's still good. Cool. Uh, yeah. Good advice then. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So Craig asks, work-life balance. How do you guys balance full-time positions, instructing at CGMA, and such? Uh, I can answer this one. I don't. 
<laughs> I do not. You could ask Kurt. I'm the worst yeah, at work great. life balance. <laughs> yeah, I was uh I was getting pretty burnt out, but it's important to pay attention to your mental health. I think Clinton is like an alien and he just <laughs> what? I I don't know how, but um I think like just setting aside time and I used to be like, oh, once I find time, I'll try and do this. But now I'm starting lately to just think more like I, I need to make time to like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, make time to just do nothing or make time to like browse on Reddit or whatever. And make, without make feeling guilty. Yeah. Without feeling guilty of, that I'm not doing something. Um, yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Nee Lima asks, does your entire environment art team work on a level at once? Or is it broken up into teams working on different levels? Yeah, so uh, we're kind of like a hit squad, and we just jump around from level to level, and we just make assets for different areas and problem solve and make uh, like whatever people feel like they need. Sometimes a level artist will be like, I just want an internal person to do this because I can walk up and talk to them and stuff. And then there's level artists who are focused on specific like levels and assembling those levels with the assets that we make. Good. Yeah, Aswin has a pretty good question, and I'm going to have to go back in our PDF, but he asked, for those who are not too familiar with the game production pipeline, can you please pick a sample from your portfolio PDF and explain how many artists it takes to create the end environment? Uh, let me pick one that I know, I think both of you, say, like, for example, here's one from you, Kurt. Yeah. Um, for this piece right here, was it all you, or um, how much help did No, you so... Uh, what happened with this is it was assembled by the level artist, and then there was a lighting artist who was lighting that area. And then um, we did a review, and it was just kind of looking a bit like uh, bland. And so I suggested that we did like a sort of more geometric theme style and all that sort of stuff. And then so I just took the existing assets and kind of retextured all those assets and then reassembled the level. And then I sent that over to the level artist, and then he pasted that back into his level. But this is only one portion, and one level will have like, uh, you know, one or two lighting artists, and maybe up to three level artists, and then, um, like, at least on gears, like we'll just we have a team of like, fifty outsourcers and like five or six internal guys working on assets for all those levels. Awesome, cool. Greg asks, how often? slash important is it as an environment modeler to be able to create environments from your imagination versus from concept art given to you? Um, I would say concept is good, but you don't always get it. Like it's very yeah. rare. Like I think I think a coalition I maybe got like, say, say if I made 100 assets, maybe only 10 of those had some kind of either reference or um, concept that was given to provide like how it should look. Um, generally you need to understand just like what, what the game is that you're making, like what the, like the kind of art style guide is or what the Bible is like of what, how they want it to look is going to be. Yeah. Uh, and so with gears, it's a very defined look that they're after typically. Um, but most times it's going to be a lot of like online research or like, uh, you know, looking at real life things to understand like how something's going to actually be made because you're not going to always have someone to be like, Hey, this is how I want it to be made. It might just give you like one or two instructions. Like, Oh, I want it to be brass and I want it to be this size and that's it. The rest is like up to you. And so sometimes you just kind of kind of be creative. Yeah. Like extrapolating either from the vague concepts or from an established style and putting like a twist on that style based on like real life reference is uh, mm -hmm. probably a, one of the more important skills I would say. For sure. Like, if someone's like make a chair and it's like, Oh, that just looks like a chair on earth versus like a chair that belongs in the gears of war universe. Cause they don't have time to concept every single prop. So you have to kind of put your own spin on it. Got it. Cool. And then just quickly before we go further, um, how are you guys doing on time? Kurt? Glenn? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm okay right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can go continue then. Uh, Mifflefish asks, oops, hold on. One second. Okay. What should you consider to be the differences between level designers and, I'll set it again, level designers and environment artists? Are they very distinct roles or is there a lot of overlap? Uh, go, you know, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, sure. So I would say that in triple A development, like there's uh, a lot of um, sort of separation between the two. 
Um, level designers, like I said, they'll find the fun. And then they're just worried about like placing blocks and being like, oh, if I take cover here, it's more fun than if I take cover over here or whatever. Uh, level artists will are more focused on the composition and the lighting and like making the scene feel cohesive and make sense and look nice to look at. So I think that hasn't always been the case. And again, it depends on studios. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked with people who have been both designers, lighters, and level artists all at once. But that's kind of like back of Mass Effect 2 era. So I'm not sure how common that is, like in AAA development anymore. Yeah, even yeah, even at Midwinter with a smaller studio, we still have like level artists or level designers, I guess, relatively. And um, their tasks are just a little bit more wide comparatively to like with Coalition. So like level designers there, they'll be doing like blueprints and understanding how like like Kurt said, like what makes the game fun and like what makes it, it uh, exciting to Putting play it. design docs together and stuff yeah, like that. Exactly. And so like that's more of their role, whereas as a uh, level artist, you're more of just like you're you're building like what makes sense out of what extrapolate from what they've given you to what makes the game fun and to making it look good as well. Yeah. Like just focused on like you take a screenshot and it looks cool sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm, like layout composition mostly yep. most likely yep. okay cool daniel asks is your course okay to do for someone who has learning difficulties with picking up and understanding concepts he finds it very hard to pick up anything but gets stumped on likes of trim sheets and cannot progress until he understands yeah i think um i think when it comes to that kind of stuff i try to i'm a really big proponent to that not everyone's going to learn at the same rate right and sometimes like there's usually in my class, like we do, we go, we go over pretty heavily about trim sheets because I feel like that's a major thing to know about for modular design. And I think everyone at certain, at one point or another, within the first five weeks, they'll have an aha moment where they're like, oh, that's how it works. But like, not everyone gets that at the same point. And so, like, I'll continuously do QAs or like answer any questions or like make sure to respond to emails or whatnot, just to make sure that like each person is learning at their own rate. Uh, and so in the end, I, I, I'm all, I, I don't know of time where somebody says, I, I don't understand it at all. Like usually by the end, everyone's like, okay, I understand it, I get it. And now I can, I can use this for my own uh, kind of scene to make it how I want it. Yeah, I think like, um, like for my class, it's the same sort of thing where like, if you're stuck on something, like we can, like you could, if you're stuck on something in week two, like just keep handing it in, keep asking questions about it. Like we can go over whatever you want. Like I'm pretty easy. So if you have any questions about anything, like we can keep talking about it as much as until you kind of get that, uh, until you can kind of say, oh, cool, I got it now. And then at the end too, we kind of like for the last week, I'm just kind of like, okay, let's circle back. And if you guys have any, like any other sort of questions about anything else or like you're still confused about something like, um, like this is kind of like the final week that we can take a look at it and just kind of explain it until it's understood. I also try to like get the whole class to kind of like be active on the forums and stuff and talking and helping out and stuff because I know it's a digital classroom, but I think just kind of fostering that environment helps people like because then you can like be like, hey, I'm working on this or I'm showing this and people can kind of get that discussion discussion going and uh, yeah, go from there. Michelle asks, is it okay to have both stylized and realistic models slash textures in your portfolio? Should these be separated somehow or tailored in a certain way? Um, I think as long as you are very, um, what's it called, purposeful or um, uh, what's that term? Where basically you, you make it look like you obviously did this on purpose to make it look stylized or you're obviously trying deliver to deliver it. Yeah. Yeah, like deliver it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like I think when it starts to get kind of fuzzy where it's in between where it's like, is this supposed to be stylized or realistic or like what kind of like yeah. thing are they going for? And it's like really muddled throughout your portfolio. I think that's where it becomes a concern if you can produce either quality, like like realistic work or quality stylized work. It's like you want to know if it's def like definitive or not. Yeah, like if you're just kind of putting like stylized as an asterisk because you're like I'm stuck on and I can't push past yeah. that realism, then um, sometimes you can like you can kind of feel that when you're looking at the whatever you're trying to make, right? So um, I think like yeah, just kind of being deliberate helps a lot, and it helps to sort of tailor your portfolio if you're wanting to work at a stylized place like Blizzard, uh, having things in that style instead of just kind of going all over the place and don't use it as an excuse for 
um, stopping and not pushing yourself. For sure. Cool. Mariano asks, what do you recommend to a foreigner if he wants to work in the industry of Canada or the United States? Oh man, uh, that's a tricky uh, one. So like, yeah, that's always an issue, I think. And it's, it's like just something right now that's like, it can be very difficult sometimes. Uh, I had a mentee that uh, was working here, uh, going to school here and in, um, in Vancouver, and he was uh, Israeli, and he had a really hard time getting work only because of his nationality. And so mm -hmm. it's not so much about like, it, when it comes to that point, it's not so much about your art sometimes as it is about your like visa stuff. So I, I would suggest that you need wedding that's uh, a foreigner from either Canada or from the U S to really just like talk to a lawyer and to really get some insight as to what kind of visa you need to be able to work in either U S or Canada, because that'll really make a difference on what kind of studio can hire you because like smaller studios typically can't afford the cost to bring someone, uh, internationally. Um, as whereas bigger studios sometimes have a little bit more funds to do that kind of thing. So it just depends. I think it's also easier to get into Canada. I'm not too yes, familiar with that process, but for sure. I think like uh, versus the US, it's easier to go definitely. to Canada. Now for you, Clinton, you're a US citizen? Yeah, I'm a US citizen. Working in yeah. Canada. Do you have yep. to do work visa by any chance? Uh, I did, I did do a work Canada? visa when I first started, uh, and I got that through okay. the contract company that I um, was working for when I came up through here. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a, I think it was a two year work visa. And it was a renewable up to, I think, I think six years, I think it was or something oh, like okay. that. Um, but I ended up applying for PR after my first year, which is permanent residency. So I could, I didn't have to leave if I didn't want to. So uh, now I'm a permanent resident of Canada. And that was that um, I have a friend that was working at um, San Francisco with me. That was a Canadian that um, actually mm -hmm. lives here in Vancouver as well. Um, and he, when he went to the States, he had a very opposite um, interaction where it was very difficult to get PR. It was very difficult to get a lot of things done. Whereas I'm finding here in Canada, they're a lot more open to um, foreign, um, foreign nationals, like just improving their society and just kind of contributing to the game market here in Vancouver. Got it. Cool. All right. Let me da, da. Let's see. Whoa. Still scrolling through the questions. Hold yeah, on there's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you guys, okay for another ten minutes? That'd be yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. Yep. All right. I think I lost my spot now. Let's see what should be. So we did that. We did Daniel's question. Oh, uh, how important is composition opposed to individual assets oh. reading well? That was Vince's question. Yep. There you go. Go for it. All right. Um, yeah, so I think that, um, yeah, composition is obviously super important. Again, it depends. Like, if you're just be like wanting to do assets on a AAA game versus being a level artist are two different things. Um, and then obviously other studios kind of roll those both together. But um, yeah, composition and lighting and just like those two things to me kind of go hand in hand with your assets reading well, just having good composition and lighting so that your materials can sing and really kind of bring your scene to life are uh, like kind of one and the same. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think the first thing I typically notice about someone's portfolio is it's even though it's not, it's not, it's a secondary thought to most environment artists when they first start out is, but it's lighting. Yeah. So like if the lighting looks good on the prop or the environment, like I'm usually sold because like, you can get away with so much more when you have good lighting on like what looks yeah. good and what doesn't look good. And so I think just making sure that either if you only have, if you only have props, make sure they're lit really well. If you only have environments, make sure they're lit really well. Yeah. That also helps too. like, just start with your lighting first. Cause then you can say like, Oh, I don't need to make this look amazing. Cause it's kind of in the darkness anyway. And you can kind mm -hmm. of like craft your time and spend your time where it counts. Yeah, exactly. Aswin asked a point that you guys touched on earlier in the seminar. There's going to be, okay, there's going to be a lot of confusion and overlap when starting on a scene and dividing work among artists. How do you structure your design doc and is it strictly adhered to? So more of a pipeline question. Um, I think that's uh, pretty well sorted at the coalition. Um, it's kind of down pat now where like level design places just 
uh, colored blocks, level art uh, replaces those with gray block meshes, and then the environment team will make turn those gray block meshes into assets, and it just gets auto-populated and it auto-updates because the assets have already been uh, placed in the level. So I think Clinton could probably speak a bit more to that because it. Uh, I think it's, I if I'm guessing, it's probably a bit more uh, flexible over there. Yeah, it's 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 a bit more like um, it's a bit more like uh, I guess like claimed ownership of particular areas or tasks. So like basically like when you go into sprints, so like each sprint they'll be like, okay, what do we want to get achieve this sprint? And you basically say like, okay, like we want to get this building done and we want to get this you know bridge done and we want to get this structure done, blah, blah, blah. And so like basically like out of the environment artists that are there, they'll say, okay, I, I'll take on that building and I'll do this thing. And then that way you kind of know who's working with what. And then um, just having open communication between you and the other artists is really key because you'll, you'll find sometimes you'll have overlapping things that you're working on. And so to save yourself both a bunch of headache from like, oh, I made 17 concretes. Well, I made 17 concretes too. Like, why do we have so many concretes? Like, it's basically like just communicating with each other. Um, and it's it's pretty easy when it's a small studio, there's only like three guys, right? So like you just kind of communicate between you and just make sure that everyone knows what everyone else is working on. Okay. Ruzi asks, is it necessary to have a personal website for my portfolio or can I only use ArtStation? I, I would say if you're gonna use ArtStation, use ArtStation Pro. Um, yep. I would say, I, I personally have I have both. I got the Pro and the R Station or the a Squarespace, which I use for my um, personal website. I use Squarespace because I like the flexibility a bit, where it has a bit more like layout changes and like um, on how you can design the layout. Because I have a like a bunch of extra stuff on the site. But if you're just like starting out, and you're just getting a simple portfolio. I would highly suggest just using uh, R Station Pro. It's like really easy to set up. It's really easy to get like you know going right off the bat and it doesn't require like any web programming or knowing like HTML script or anything like that. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, same. I would just say, just go for pro if, uh, yeah, if you're like, don't really care too much about the layout and stuff. I'm not too picky with my website. I just, I mainly just look at ArtStation anyway, but it's nice to have your like a legit like pro mm -hmm. website. Okay. Mifflefish asks, Okay, lots of questions rolled into one. For Clinton's course, what sort of skill foundation would be a good idea to have going in? So let's start with that one first. Sure, so like uh, I would say you've modeled at least one prop before, you've textured at least one prop before. It could be in just Photoshop or Substance Painter or something like that. Uh, you have a general idea of how game assets are made. You know how to bake a normal map. Uh, you, have, you, own a, you own a baking software so you can bake some kind of normal. Um, and you've maybe opened Unreal once or twice. Cool. And then the, the follow-up question is, when a, when approximately do you expect the next course to be? I'm assuming after the spring term, which starts, I believe, April 28th, 26th? Yeah. yeah, the next term is starting pretty soon. And then after that, I think there's, it's basically like uh, like the quarters of the season. So like it's like winter, fall, uh, spring, uh, you know. Uh, so basically like just expect basically every, two and a half months there's going to be to three months there's going to be a new uh, course announced within CGMA. Okay. And then the third question is, is it expected to have a usable portfolio piece at the end of the course? Uh, yeah, uh, it is definitely expected. Um, not always the case, but I would say the most successful pieces are students that come in, they don't really know a lot about modular design. They take the course and they really focus on understanding the process and the pipeline before they just start making art. So like the students that have a harder time is like, I'm going to come in and I'm going to make this jungle scene. And they spend the first three weeks making foliage. It's like, well, you already knew how to make foliage and that didn't really help you learn modular, you know, pipeline or process. Right. And so like, yeah. that wasn't, that wasn't really helpful to, to expanding your knowledge and to use the course for what it's kind of meant for. So what I always tell students is like, come into the course, like really practice and, and learn, the, the things that we're talking about in the class. And then what most students do is they'll take the 10 weeks to, to get close to the end of their, their um, finalization of their scene. They'll have a few things that they're you know, kind of lingering or things that they, they know they can make on their own. They don't need the class to make. And they'll kind of take a, like a, anywhere from like five to 10 weeks after the course and really you know push out a really nice polished uh, scene that, at, that basically at the end is like something way better that, that they could have done before the class. 
Okay. And then a bonus last question from Mifflefish. What is your favorite aquatic animal? Uh, is it narwhal? Is that a... Is that a is yeah, that narwhal. A narwhal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, silly, goofy questions, I do have a question for you, Glennon. Sure. I, I read on your bio, <laughs> you, you claim to hide Abraham Lincoln. Yes, in your I do. artwork, dude. Yeah, cool. I, I, I hide <laughs> okay. him everywhere. So, like, all right, I'm uh, gonna have to keep I, an eye out then. Yeah, he's in everything I've ever made, uh, professional oh and freelance. Regardless of if the studio knows it's there, it's there. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, man. Hopefully, no one at the college so is do watching. I have to bleep this out? Of the... they, gotta, they, gotta, they gotta find it to, to question me about oh, it. There you go. That was good. That was really good. Okay, um, Michelle asked, "Do you or anyone you know ever hire from looking through websites like ArtStation, CG Society, etc., or only from applications?" Yeah, I approached a guy and was like, "Hey, want a job?" And then he's like, "Yeah, That's sure." Nice. And then he's starting on Monday, so. Definitely. Oh, dope! That's definitely the way to go. I think. I think it, just having your your best, you know, uh, your best work forward facing to be, you know, accessible at any time is like could land you a job at any moment. Nice, nice, nice. So, Ruzi asks for both of you, what's your dream studio you want to work with, work at, and why? Oh man, so I. I always wanted to work at Bethesda and then I did it and I was like, okay. And then I always wanted to work on Gears of War and I did it. So now I'm like, I don't know. Like I just want to <laughs> keep making fun stuff. I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to say. Your game studio is your home studio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> pajama studio. Yeah, the pajama there studio. You go. Pajama with uh, a Y. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I, what you, I think it's... I'm not really sure. Um, obviously, like there's cool projects and stuff, um, like all around the world. So it's, I don't know. It's too hard to say. I think what's more important is just working with really great people and yeah. Yeah. being able to be at a job where it, it lets you do your job and you're not fighting the tech and you're not fighting like the people or the pipeline and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, pajama I studio sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, good. That's a, I feel like that's a pretty common thing that like when people first start out, they're like, oh, what is the studio you want to work at? But after about five years yeah. in the industry, you start to think like, what kind of daily lifestyle do I want? And then what studio fits that lifestyle? And I think it's really about like, what do you enjoy? Like, do you enjoy like, what part of the process do you enjoy? Like, how do you like to interact with people? what kind of game do you like to make? And those things will actually change what your initial decision of was or what your initial like dream studio was when you first started in the industry. Yeah, totally. Like you might be like, I want to work at the studio. It's so amazing. And it's like, uh, they do like 80 hours a week for ever. Or yeah. it's like, <laughs> oh, I want to work at this studio and it's amazing. And it's like, well, they just basically outsource everything or, mm. or like anything like that. Right. <laughs> There's so many different things to like a studio that it's, it's hard to just be like, yeah, I'm just going to work at this place. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's always best to investigate studio culture too before you start dreaming about working there. Yeah. How often can I drink beer on company time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so this will be the last question um, from Vince. At what point should an artist feel comfortable with their skill set? I know it's probably never. It's never. It's. I. I think this is a constant thing with artists. You're always going to doubt yourself. I can't honestly say any job I've ever gone to, I thought I was ready. I just I just did it and I was like, here we go. Hope they don't fire me. Like it's yeah. just always like <laughs> it's just always like just assuming the best about yourself and then hoping for the best and just like putting your best foot forward. Yeah. Um there's this funny thing I just posted in the chat and uh it's a sign out in happiness comic and it's just like the creator's curse and it's like it's a funny read. But basically like every time I do something or uh, work on anything like that, I'm just like, oh, I don't know if it'll be good. And it turns out, I'm like, I guess it was pretty good. So, um, yeah, it's it's good to always be thinking that you can improve because that's how you get better and that's how you learn. For sure. And also keep awesome. in mind we're, the, we're in the tech industry and everything's going to age within like a year and you're going to look back yeah. and be like, that was awful. Why did I yes. make that? Already, yeah. <laughs> I'm already like, I just delete my whole portfolio. Like, I yeah. oh. nah, <laughs> <laughs> got it yeah yeah um Ruzi, yes there will be more webinars um there's actually i'm doing one on saturday with fabio sino 
He's from Industrial Light and Magic. He'll be teaching our intro to rigging course. So stay tuned for that. I think they maybe sent out the um, one of the newsletters. If not, um, we can talk more about it on the at the end notes. Um, I know there's so many awesome questions, uh, but I don't want to take too much of their time. It's already 8:30. So if you do have any more questions, maybe you could just post them. If you if you have access to Facebook, just post them at our our group. It's called CG Society Meetup. Um, this is where we uh, organize the events for those who are uh, connected on Facebook. And it's just a nice way to see when when the events take place, organize your calendars, et cetera. And then also um, to catch the webinar replay, it's posted on cgsociety.org when our marketing team gets to it. So yeah, definitely. Oh. Well, it has yeah. been a pleasure Thanks, chatting with you, uh, Kurt and Clinton. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, it was, it was a blast. I had I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks for and the questions, everyone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then hopefully if I head up there, uh, maybe I could buy you guys a drink. For sure. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah totally. I'm yeah. down for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I think uh, there was one important question, though. I think Daniel asked was um, just, just the way CGMA structures our, our courses. You provide live feedback for the students, and then an offer yeah, so Q and A, right? Yeah, yeah, so it's one hour, one hour Q and A every week, uh, and that's usually scheduled at the same time every week. And then um, it'll be after you turn your assignments in per week. It's a five minute, at least five minutes per student uh, per week, uh, and typically um, it usually goes over. For, it could be anywhere from like five to ten, depending on you know like the yeah. intensity of questions or like what what kind of you know like where they're at in the process or like if they're having troubles or whatnot. Cool. Yeah. Same. Awesome. Okay. And then just on the last note for our listeners and audience, where can they connect with you online? Uh, Clinton uh, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, yeah. Instagram, Facebook. or on any yeah, of those I'm, platforms. I'm, I'm always on Facebook. Yeah. Facebook's a good way to go. Art station. Uh, any of those places is good. Yep. Same and for you. Just, Kurt? Yeah. You can net. Random people add me on Facebook all the time. It's fine. You can just add me, and if you have questions, you can we can talk um, and email Art Station and stuff like that. Like um, just however. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Great questions. Great chatting with you all. Uh, I'm Michael Kabuko signing off for tonight, and have a good rest of your day. All right. See ya. See ya. Okay. See you guys later. Bye bye.